Good evening. Uh, welcome back to the Liquid Antiquarian. We are back. Well, I say we, actually, Dave is not with us tonight. He is stuck in Montilla, Jerez, up to his, his oxters in PX, was as he described it, drinking fino and other nice sherry over there. So let's not feel too sorry for him, but don't worry. Um, we're not falling out. The uh, dynamic, dusty duo will be back on Monday when we continue this little series um, digesting, analysing, reacting to this incredible book. Um, I think the whiskey community is still digesting it a little bit, trying to work out its significance. We all know it is very, very big and very, very exciting. Um, so it is, if you just stumbled across uh, this episode and not quite sure and what I'm talking about, so this is the distilleries of Great Britain and Ireland, the journey through the heartlands of whiskey, 1922 to 1929, published by the blender and independent bottler, James Eady Limited, um, a great supplier, a supplier of ours and a blender and independent bottler of great skill, who I admire enormously. I admire them even more now because they have made this happen. What is it? Um, so it is a series of articles that were published in the Wine and Spirit Trade Record in the 20s. And it was a set of distillery visits, serialised, as I say, with photographs, describing 124 different distilleries, a few gin distilleries, a few Irish distilleries in there, but mostly Scotch single malt whiskey distilleries. And it represents um, this complete, well, not complete, but uh, amazing set of descriptions and photographs of these distilleries. Many of them lost, many of them demolished a long time ago. And even the ones that are in existence today, they are greatly changed. So, I mean, it's hard to describe the significance of it. As I say, we're all st still taking this in. In a previous life, I did a degree in archaeology and a little bit of professional archaeological work. It feels to me, especially with these photographs, that this is, well, archaeologists, they root around looking for bones and shadows in the ground and lines of rocks and things like this. We've not just found the bones here. It's like when they cut Otzi the Iceman um, out of the glacier from between... Uh, I think it was Italy and Austria that bought it. We don't just get the bones. With these photographs, we get to see the skin, the hair, and the guts of these distilleries. It really is an amazing contribution to whiskey culture, to the whiskey community, and it's a huge achievement by uh, Leon, who you'll meet very soon. Uh, a, a huge contribution to our understanding of 20th century whiskey. And I'm sure it is a book that will be read and referred to for many years to come. So I'll get that big compliment out of the way for, Le uh, for Leon because he doesn't like to be the centre of attention. He's very, very modest. I think I can see him blushing backstage. So while we let that blush depart, um, I was going to just give a little bit of context to... Uh, the articles. Many of you might have already bought this book and enjoyed it over the last week or so. It was released exactly a week today and it's doing very, very well. Um, but it's a series of articles and they're not in isolation. I thought it was worth actually talking a little bit, five, ten minutes maybe, just about the publication itself. And Leon has obviously airlifted these articles out of the magazine and photographs and had them digitised with the help of the British Library digitisation team. But they don't exist in isolation. So what is the magazine? Um, who's reading it? Who's advertising in it? Uh, let's just have a little look and explore that. So first of all, this is um, the month of April 1924. Um, yes, published in April uh, 1924. And I've got some images of uh, advertisers um, and a few articles and things like that, which I would like to show you. So this is the magazine here. You can see a number of uh, adverts on the front there. Covassier, Port, Mercier, Champagne, Martel, even some olive oil. That's actually quite unusual. Um, and here is one of the articles in situ, if you will. So this is the Bayburn distillery visit. 
And so, as I say, it's alongside um, other drinks, in this case, uh, Port, Brandy, Hutchison & Co, Shippers. Here is the other article that was um, in this uh, monthly edition. That's Scotia, just tucked off the left, and you can see Burgundy, Pierre Ponel, um, bottled wines, considerable stock in London. But not just alcohol. Uh, in the middle there, we've got Speeds, Bell of the Orient, Egyptian cigarettes, um, uh, Bowls Kummel on the right there, and Warwick's Advocat, a brand that still exists and sits languishing at the back of many cocktail bars. Um, I noticed there also it was the first Advocat to be sold in fluid form from the year 1912. I didn't realize you could get solid Advocat. I don't know how you have solid Advocat uh, on toast, on a crumpet, maybe. Um, rum. Here we have some Jamaican uh, rum listed with the various crops and the various marks. Rum geeks will appreciate that. That's Mars and Sun. And then over on the left, you've got Rowie Leaking Co. rums. And you can see Highland Park sitting there just in the middle alongside other things, alongside Australian wines and Algerian wines. So I know we're all, well, we're maybe not all whiskey geeks here, but there'll be a lot of focus on the whiskey elements here, but it's just one drink among many in this magazine. And there's some softer content as well, um, educational pieces. Um, so this is one page here of, which lists wooden wine vessels. It's probably the longest historical article on various different cup types of cups and drinking vessels I've ever seen. Um, it stretched for 15, 20 pages, I think, with lots and lots of images of different drinking cups, um, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, so it, which seemed to be purely educational as well. And I think there's elements of the articles that are educational as much as anything rather than trying to sell it, sell anything. Um, then this one even had how it's talking to the trade. This presumably is a celebrity of the trade, Mr. R. Kenneth Cock of Cock, Russell and Co. And this is actually a, in fact, I've got it here, I guess. Uh, yeah. So this is actually a pull-out supplement poster of Mr. R. Kenneth Cock to stick on your, on your wall. And he's just a, a prominent trader. Um, so it is a trade publication. And with that comes advertisements for all the various things you might need. Uh, capsules, bottles, straw envelopes, corks and sundries, uh, cooperage. Um, the list, I could have shown many, many uh, um, adverts there. Uh, gauges, for example, um, all sorts, as well as all the various different brokers, etc. cetera. Um, and then what about the whiskey adverts? Because there's some doozies in here. Let's start with the big boy, the Distillers Company Limited. On the left there, this is two separate pages. Um, you've got some big bruising grain distilleries. Of course, the Distillers Company um, uh, made a lot of grain whiskey and pushed the concept of grain whiskey um, pretty hard. And they wanted blends over malts. Uh, I think that's pretty uncontroversial to say. Although Nocdu is sitting there as a, as a malt, Scotch malt whiskey distillery. But then also on the right hand side, the only distillery in Glenlivet, the Glenlivet distillery, also um, from the Distillers Company Limited, 12 Torpican Street, Edinburgh. Um, the only distillery in Glenlivet, I'm pretty certain we'll see there's a few other people claiming to be Glenlivet in a sec. Uh, Irish whiskey as well. Um, what else do we have? We have Grant Stand Fast. And dear Ken John Haig. But you'll notice quite small, admittedly, down there, sole proprietors of the Glenfiddich and Balveni Glenlivet distilleries. So within these adverts, there's interesting relationships between blended whiskey, single malt whiskey, um, uh, being sold, so malt whiskey being sold as an ingredient, but yet it was also drunk as uh, a self whiskey or single malt. Here's another example. Uh, Buchanan Scotch whiskies, black and white and royal household, but then they list their distilleries, Bankia and Glen Tocker's Glenlivet distillery. 
they would be asked to stop using that later in the century, the, the Glenlivet suffix. Highland Queen, I've blown up, that's the same, uh, I've just basically blown up that detail. Old whiskey is becoming scarcer today, but owing to the something policy of this house, far, far sighted policy of this house, in accumulating large stocks of old whiskey, Highland Queen always maintains its high standard of quality. Their distilleries are Glen Morangy Distillery and Glen Murray, Glen Livet Distillery. Uh, old whiskey becoming scarce, probably because we are not, the, the First World War is not that long ago. And uh, so um, age stocks are potentially pretty rare. Um, I've shown, yes, the Rout Leaky Rum and Co on the right, Rum Swan with Highland Park in the middle. But then on the right, then we've got another merchant trader with Tiananich Distillery, Glen Lossy, Glen Libet Distillery. Uh, but again, mixed in with other drinks and with equal or even less prominence with other drinks, Chartreuse, Louis Rodera, Thomas Hein Cognac, etc. And to show this relationship between uh, single malt as its own thing, as its own drink, but then also as an ingredient, this Highland Park advert is a, is a lovely example of that. If you're going to build a great house, be sure um, your foundation is good. On a poor foundation, you can build nothing of value. The foundation of a fine blend of Scotch whiskey must be North Country malt. There are many good North Country whiskies, but it will be difficult to find one that will make a surer foundation than Highland Park. For sample of new make, apply to distillers. And then, oof, let's just end with uh, the, um, the lovely adverts like this. The Freud Distillery. Presumably purchased as an ingredient, but also in its own right and drunk in its own right. Glendronach Distillery, there you go, there's Cock, Russell and Co. That lovely illustration of Glendronach. And our Beg, McDougall and Co. Limited. So there's an interesting mix of how whiskey is presented depending on the audience. Um, and I must say, it's a really good publication as well. There's lots to enjoy in there. And many, many, many adverts, hundreds and hundreds of adverts. But then, of course, we don't have the internet. And if you are a wine merchant or grocer or small blender or, or someone who works within the industry, a publican perhaps, then this is the place you would find the relevant information you need to start or build or, or change your business. Uh, I see loads of comments flying in. Um, Thank you. That's great to know you didn't forget about us and um, and you uh, wanted to watch a bit more Liquid Antiquarian. We really appreciate it. Once we get talking um, to Leon a little bit more, I might be able to uh, keep an eye on those comments, bring some up on screen, maybe even ask some questions um, directly of Leon, pick out a few of the things. We can see what you're typing on uh, YouTube and, um, and Facebook. So I'll bring in Leon, and I'm not sure if I said at the beginning of the show, um, but we'll also have Tom Bruce Gardine, spirits writer, uh, wine writer, who was one of the very first people to find out about the entirety of this project and had the honor of writing the introduction and an excellent introduction it is too. So let's bring in the hero of the hour. Hi, Leon. Hi, Arthur, how are you doing? Yes, I'm good, I'm good. So. Um, congratulations again. Uh, so glad you've managed to get this over the line. I, you, you kindly shared details of this about five years ago, I think it was. And since then, I've been this cheerleader, but a slightly aggressive cheerleader. Um, <laughs> whenever I saw you say, get the book done, and uh, at times seething with jealousy that you had found, you had found it, um, because Dave and I were busy kind of panning for little flecks of gold in these kind of backwaters of history and meanwhile you were hacking off whole nuggets of gold from this mine you had found but um uh the jealousy is all past now and i'm just so pleased you brought this um to the world no absolutely and, and also i have to be honest as well uh i am extremely grateful to you and some of the other aggressive cheerleaders 
uh, who were encouraging us to publish this for years and years. I think I told you at, at some point around 2018, I realized that in addition to the small voice in the back of my mind saying, I think this could be interesting, maybe we should publish it. A second voice in the form of Arthur Motley also appeared back there and was you know, chipping away, telling me to, to publish it. And uh, it's very, very nice that we've been able to come full circle a few years later and, and finally let the cat out of the bag and, and, you know, get to present it and talk it through with you. So, yeah, very, very happy to be here. It's a good news story. It's a really, really good news story for the whiskey community. Um, so I'm really interested in the process of discovery. Um, you were, and we are drinking a bit of it, you were researching Trademark X, uh, I believe, the blend that was resurrected by your boss, Rupert Patrick, and you found something in the uh, in the British Library. How did that start? Which article did you find first? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, it's... it's. Uh, I mean, you're, you're asking me to sort of delve back into the mists of time, a, a simpler time of, of 2015, where actually we just begun to resurrect the James E.D. business. So James E.D., for, for those of you watching who don't know, uh, founded in 1854, uh, brewing company as well as a blending company, and uh, was making a blended whiskey, which uh, amongst other people, Alfred Barnard was uh, actually one to, to try and sample and write about it and also meet James E.D. And uh, he went there ostensibly to talk about beer in the four volume history of the breweries of the United Kingdom. Uh, but he ended up basically sitting down in an armchair and sharing a dram with James Eady and talking about this fantastic blended whiskey, which had been handed down to him by his father and, and which he was trying and, and thoroughly enjoying. And also as an aside, he said that James Eady was a thoroughly nice chap as well, which was an added bonus. So we had these sort of tantalizing <laughs> nuggets uh of information that were out there but but you know as as i'm sure you've come across with the liquid antiquarian as well you you find a small piece of information and and it's you know quite captivating and then it's a dead end and you, and you really don't know what to find so uh we basically decided at that point you know reviving the james E. D. business we should revive the blended whiskey that he was making and, and his descendants uh were making up until the 1940s uh, we had one of the last bottles uh, remaining. We tried that along with Tom, actually, and and Dave. Uh, and there's a video on YouTube if, if anyone wants uh, to see us drinking it in real time. Um, and we were looking for kind of more information about what was in this this lovely whiskey. Um, and so we went to lots of different um, archives and libraries and so on and so forth. And in the National Brewery Centre in Burton, we found his ledgers, and that led us on to uh you know reviving the the whiskey itself of trademark x um but as part of the wider process what we also did is we went to the british library amongst other places and you know did the traditional thing of try to get our hands on as many copies of uh, anything from that period as possible to try and illuminate the history of james Eady. um and we came across this phenomenal resource called the wine and spirit trade record um, so the wine and spirit trade record began in 1874, uh, continued for almost 100 years, almost made it 100 years. It made it to 1971, where it changed ownership and it changed uh, the kind of profile and it became more of a kind of glossy wine and spirit magazine. I think it was called Wine and Spirit International. But basically for 100 years, um, it was giving, as, as you showed so kind of, brilliantly just just before such an incredible breadth and overview of everything that was happening in the wine and spirit business not just whiskey lots of other things not a huge amount on beer unfortunately which is problematic for james e., although we did find some stuff in there um but very very good specifically on whiskey now the british library has everything from 1898 uh, up until, well, with, with some gaps up until actually 1971. Uh, so that was great. So, uh, you know, as you do when you're presented with a huge amount of information, you just sort of dive in there and see what you can find. And, um, yeah, we found quite a lot of stuff. <laughs> we, yeah, found, yeah. we found quite a lot of stuff and, and probably have digested about, you know, two or three percent of what's in those, you know, as, as you showed, there's just a huge amount of stuff 
from one volume from one month let alone for 40 years 50 years 60 years that we were looking at uh, but in in addition to this james Eby stuff we found some some articles and you know initially when i was having a look at these you know thought okay this is interesting we saw a couple i can't remember which ones we saw in first i think actually there were some of the ones in the middle 1926 1927 uh, i vaguely remember maybe thomas street the irish one being being one of the first ones um but it was very very hard to sort of digest and take in what was there because there were so many things and it was really only you know in 2016 um when we sort of sat down and looked at it and we realized that you know there wasn't just a sort of disparate group of articles but it was actually a full series and and you know maybe this doesn't reflect very well on me given that each one was numbered all the way through but as you and other people that have come across this book have probably experienced it's quite overwhelming at first um and so it it sort of dawned on us that um that this was a, a big full series which had actually been been undertaken over a period of seven years basically spanning the whole of the 1920s um the 1920s you know is uh, as a decade the scotch whiskey was pretty turbulent frankly as a decade for the world was also quite turbulent so you know there was a lot of rich material going on there um but i'll, I'll be totally honest with you arthur my my initial assumption was that this must be in print and i must be a fool for not knowing that um mm. because there you know there was just so many pictures i mean it, you know very similar i suppose the only comparable thing that i could think of at the time was was alfred barnard but you know with a few photographs uh so i reached out to a few people at the time i knew that one of the well it, it dawned on me actually that one of the articles had been published which was the highland park one which was actually the article that you the, the advert that you just put up there the um good foundation one they paired that advert with the distillery profile turned it into a pamphlet and some years later that was reproduced by Harlan Park and Ian Buxton so that was the only one that I was aware of I, I contacted uh, quite a number of people uh, just saying you know I've, I've come across this series of articles are, are you aware of whether you know of this and whether it's still in print and, um, universally no basically so it's, then we were sort of okay it's sorry. a strange feeling that i've had that a couple of times where you think you're wrong um and then you realize that no no one has written about this and you do feel like a fool for not having read this important thing you found i mean it, it's the 1823 act for me i just yeah. assumed everyone else had read it and then i asked the people i knew who should have read it and they all said no why would i read that <laughs> exactly yeah it's i mean it's really a very very odd experience actually and sort of and so, so we then ended up having quite a nice problem to have but a problem nonetheless which was basically that um we were we'd literally just started off an independent bottling company we were in the process of trying to revive you know a lost blend and then also potentially we were looking at uh you know publishing a book as well and it's quite a hard package to be able to explain to people what you actually do. Um, so we, we decided to park it for the time being and, and focus on the bottling and the blending and, and so on and so forth, which was the right decision to do. Um, but then explored various avenues. I mean, the, the, you know, looking at, at the ways to do it and so on. And we had no experience ever publishing a book. Uh, that presents its own challenges. Uh, we are a very small company of three people. There's uh, Rupert, uh, the founder, who's the great great grandson of James E. There's myself, and there's uh, Hugh Barron, uh, who manages our sales. And so, between the three of us, we we do everything uh, together. You know, uh, we you know select all the cast together. We we dis decide on the products together. I mean, every single thing. Very very small team, limited resources. And so the prospect of, you know, publishing <laughs> a three kilo book uh, with uh, a, you know, full on digitization process happening with the British Library and so on was at the beginning of quite a daunting task. But uh, after speaking to uh, several people over the years, uh, you, as you said, probably the most aggressive and the forthright cheerleader of them all. 
uh, we decided that we really ought to do this. And so that that was that decision was probably reached in uh, summer of 19, uh, 20, 1920, no, not that far. Uh, yeah, 2020. Uh, but then obviously that was in COVID, the digitization process has been held up by that design process. Uh, you know, these things, everything that sh seems like it should be a very quick thing um, is not, certainly not doing it correctly. Um, and, and for us, it was a, a completely new challenge. You know, it was, it was something that we had, had really never done. And, and actually in that, um, the best thing that happened for the whole project is we were able to rely on people that were incredibly good at what they do, uh, far, far, far more capable of what they do than I am at whatever <laughs> it is that I do. Um, and so, you know, we had um, James Hutchison, Jim, who designed the book, who has done many, many books and, you know, uh, focus on, on all the right things to make this as accurate and, and close to the original publication, which is what we really wanted. We wanted to, to give people that feeling of discovering the book and being drawn in to this world of the 1920s to, as the subtitle sort of puts it, to go through this journey through the heartlands of whiskey. That, that feeling, the same feeling that you probably had when you flicked open the One Spirit trade record and you're seeing uh, you know, the typeface, the the images, the layout, you know, all of that. That was really, really critical. I mean, the, the cover, the designing of the cover was, uh, you know, we went to various rare book shows to see what books from the 1920s, how they were designed. I mean, the, the cover is partially based on the 1920s first edition of Winnie the Pooh, actually, which had a, a red, <laughs> uh, no, green cover with just a, a singular gold we need the poo holding a balloon. So, you know, it was trying to trying to get that kind of balance between the, you know, authenticity to the past without uh, going, you know, full mock Tudor or so. But and Jim did a, a wonderful job, you know, laying out the book, getting the typeface. I mean, the typeface is basically uh, it's it's almost impossible to tell the difference between this and what you have in the original publication. Uh, Caroline, who managed the print run, did an absolutely wonderful job of, of managing that and what as anyone who's worked in production in the last couple of years knows has been a very challenging period to get anything made um yeah and i think it's worth saying as well it nearly didn't happen on a number of occasions over the oh, last yeah. years and i once bumped into a publisher who turned down harry potter and um, met them at a, a cocktail party and i'm not going to shame the people who, who who decided this one i don't know some of them but one publisher said it, it, it didn't have commercial uh legs effectively so more than one yeah yeah, yeah more than one well there you go yeah. um so it's great to see it uh, the reception uh, that has been so so positive uh, among our customers um shall we start looking at a few images um absolutely because uh, the style of the show is very much the images, um, as well as some great nuggets in the in the uh, in the words as well. So, I thought we start with maybe Glenn Kinchy, and and this I think was one of the articles that really struck you early on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so you you, you asked the question a bit earlier about which book I re uh, which article I remember seeing first, and. As I said, it's, it was very hard to remember exactly what it is because it was so much to take in. But, you know, just flicking through the book again and, and I think, so we, t we typed the whole thing out. Um, so the act of typing it out was a very good way of actually discovering A, uh, what was in the book and B, whether the book was interesting. You know, if, if uh, I got bored of typing it at some point, then I decided that we wouldn't print it. Um, and so doing that in chronological um succession and seeing the glen kinchy article and the glen kinchy article is it just sets the scene so brilliantly um there's this quote which i taken which is just the fir first paragraph and i won't read the whole thing because it's quite a long paragraph but it it starts with although lola malts are perhaps the least picturesque of the four categories of scotch malt whiskey they constitute a highly appreciated ingredient of many well-known blends Indeed, there are probably few blends in which they are not represented to a greater or lesser extent 
and the confidence with which they are regarded by blenders is evidenced by the fact that an unusually large proportion of the total output of the round dozen or so distilleries in the Lowlands is regularly bonded by bulk brokers year after year and rarely figures in brokers' lists or auctioneers' catalogues. For many years, quite a substantial trade was done in the straight product of one or other of the Lowland distilleries. But as in the case of other categories, such preference tended to disappear before the irresistible march of the all-conquering blend. So this is the first paragraph of the of the whole series um and what you what you get in that paragraph alone they're talking about the different whiskey producing regions of scotland and the noted different characteristics that they have at the time the importance of lowland whiskies to blend the various ways in which the trade was working in terms of acquiring stock trading stock and so on and the changing relationship between single malts and blends and that's that's just the first paragraph Within the next few um, pages, it goes on to talk about the sources of barley and water, where they're getting them from, the full process of malting, mashing, fermentation, distilling, the maximum capacity that uh, the distillery has, and then also the actual annual output, the distilling season that most malt whiskey distilleries are working on at the time, the on-site premises that they have for staff, I think they describe it at one point as a miniature garden city. Uh, you have uh very um specific uh things to that moment in time as well you have the transition occurring from horsepower to lorries both of which are still in use you have the fact that the stables were recently burnt down uh as were the maltings and so have been rebuilt and then finally it ends with the names of the major employees working at the distillery and and also their past history where they'd worked before and so on and so forth and you get at the same time you get these lovely images of you know the gate going into Glenkinchy Distillery. Uh, you uh, have yeah, some of those lovely horses and carts in the background. You have the stills there, which I think Jim said that's a example of 1920s photoshopping, probably. It's a little bit touched up with a, a paintbrush just to make the, some of the things a bit clearer. Um, and you have these lovely steam engines and so on. And what's quite nice about that as well is that you're you're capturing a moment in time where you're having this transition from you know the world of alfred barnard the world of horsepower the world of you know quite heavy duty to duty labor um and so on and so forth and moving into you know a a much more modern world a, a world of uh steam mills of uh, steam engines of labor saving devices and, and a self-conscious awareness um, of both of these things uh, being you know there at the same time and, and you know if you fast forward 100 years then when people talk about more whiskey then that is the same balance between you know the past and the present and arguably the future uh, that you have in in distilleries you know the the romantic you know rustic spirit of scotch whiskey um powered there's by a, incredibly high tech engines um th yeah. there's, a, there's a pride in modernity in the way so many of these distilleries are described um but yet there are also some ways that seem incredibly old-fashioned to us and that reach back, back right into the 19th century so you've actually got both side by side and if you could choose an era to have 650 photographs from distilleries the 20s is a pretty great one in terms of what we're missing. Um, yeah. Although there have already been a couple of comments. Come on, do one on the 50s now. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we, I'm sure we will if we can. Leon, I'm sure that um, if we find that time machine, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we'd yeah. Love to do something also, like that. Among yeah, so there's this this pride in maternity. A lot of talk of the power of their engine rooms. Um, but yes, also this romanticism for the past. But there are also some pretty big distilleries there as well. Yeah. So here we've got an image of Caledonia, North British. And I think the way the grain whiskey is described is really striking. Yeah. I mean, the, the so on the one hand, I mean, they talk about with that uh, power and modernity and so on. I mean, they mentioned that um, the North British was one of the first buildings in Edinburgh to have electric lighting. You know, so this is uh, a industry and, and buildings within an industry that's really at the you know cutting edge of society 
um, in in Scotland and and you know not just in the more remote places but actually in Edinburgh itself you know right in the heart of the city um, and so that's that's quite striking another thing that's quite striking about both of these two is just like you said the sheer scale of the the distilleries um, you know they they mention the range of facilities which are on the site you know you have plasterers shops you have uh, cooperages, of course, you have fitter shops, you have, um, you know, these gargantuan warehouses. I think they use the words gargantuan, gigantic. I mean, you get the sense of whoever's visiting these um, distilleries being, you know, quite overwhelmed at the scale of what they're seeing. They talk about employing hundreds of people um, in the um, in the distilleries, and and you really do get that that sense and, and later on when you see some of the irish distilleries as well you, you see that as well um the other thing just quickly which is quite fascinating about these two distilleries is they both mentioned uh that grain whiskies at the time were made of malted barley maize rye and oats and they actually give the mash bill for north british at the time which is um mashing temperatures 140 degrees and the composition of the mash is maize 73%, malt 25%, oats 2%. Um, now, I'm sure that means more to people working in distilleries than, than it necessarily means to me, but even from a cursory glance, that seemed quite striking and you know quite quite different to what we're getting nowadays. Oats for filtration, apparently. Yeah. Um, but again, very specific and um and considered it would seem you know they had access to all these cereals they chose um uh they chose that particular mash bill um so i noticed one comment here from um where's he gone colin mayers he's he's watched liquid antiquarian before great discussion very insightful i'll watch the remaining hours on catch up um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I hope you won't <laughs> take more hours or try and batter through this, but there is so much. This is just a little overview. That's why we've tried to break it up into a few little different discussions with different specialisms, starting with the historians on Monday. Uh, the, is it Monday or Tuesday? Monday. And then the distillers next week as well, so we can talk a little bit more about the production and the equipment with Alan Winchester, formerly of Glen Limit, and Robert Fleming of uh, Tomatow and Glen Cadden uh, and things like that. But yeah, the grain distilleries are amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, uh, and then I think this is another early one that's... Uh, the image on the right, I think, has seen, been seen before, hasn't it? This laboratory. Hazel I'm not sure. Well, um, I've seen an image of the laboratory somewhere, and this is the laboratory that... Masataka Takatsuru would have worked out. Yes. Yes. And um, and what's again quite interesting about that, and I think I would imagine uh, I mean when I showed this to Nick Morgan a few months ago, that this was the image that he really focused on and, and was really sort of fascinated with. And I would imagine that he will speak um more on, on this particular image um when when he is on the show next week and, and certainly will give you much more information than I'm uh, able to do so. But I mean, again, one of the things that really jumped out to me reading this for the first time is uh, da, 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 da. within this lab, they say to facilitate these tests, the whole process of distilling is carried on in a miniature distillery, which has been cleverly fitted up in the laboratory. This is a fascinating little apparatus, including a Lilliputian malt mill modeled precisely on the lines of the large machine in the malt house. So within, within this lab, they had effectively built a tiny version of the distillery, apparently, if only there was a photo of that, uh, which they were then using to do scientific tests uh, in there. And that, you know, for me, certainly, you know, I can't claim to be massively knowledgeable, certainly nowhere in the realm of, uh, you know, the, the people that will be subsequently coming onto this show. But... This really challenged my notion of what uh, Campbelltown whiskey was, you know? And they talk about here about Hazelburn is one of the many in Campbelltown that recently come under new management with exceedingly beneficial results. Hazelburn has undergone changes which may legitimately be described as revolutionary. 
charging the local industry with new life and so on and so forth. So you get this image of a, uh, you know, the, the former whiskey capital of Scotland, where everyone assumes that because it was about to, you know, most of the distillery is about to shut a few years after these distillery articles were, were written. But this is a industry on the down and out, you know, in a death spiral. It's old fashioned, nothing is going right. It's about to disappear. And then you have someone visiting it and saying, well, wait a second. You know, what these guys are doing is absolutely revolutionary. We're about to see the second coming. Within a few years, most of the distilleries are closed. Um, so, yeah. so we've gone from high 20s of the headcount of distilleries in Campbelltown to two, effectively. Uh, three, exactly. the third that, that limps on. Um, um, and there is this crash. But the, because you know it happens, there's it's inevitable. Well, sorry, yeah. because you know it happened. There's an assumption that it's inevitable. But even this late on in the 20s, they are investing in the future. They are becoming modern. Springbank is sparklingly clean and modern, which is amusing yeah. to the modern Springbank fan, <laughs> who of course thinks of it as this cobwebby old um, hub of tradition. Um, but they have a very different view of it uh, um, in this book or in this in this series of articles. But there are some much stronger headwinds around the corner. Absolutely. And of course, we don't just visit Scotland. Um, we, we visit gin distilleries in England, but I don't think we're going to cover those today. Fascinating though, though they are. I think Joanne McCurper mentioned how um, how fascinating they are. And they are great yeah. gin distilleries. It was funny at Whiskey Fringe. There were lots of people presented with all these whiskey distilleries and they were like, gin, nah. They didn't <laughs> for it. But, um, but they are great and there's some crazy stills. But we also um, visit Ireland. Yeah. Um, so beautiful team photo. I mean, that shows that the big distillery, St. John's Lane, but um, there's a lot of people there. Yeah, I mean, so so for me, I mean, one of the, I suppose that actually the, the area that really sort of fascinated me the most when I was looking through these, and I, I think I'm right in saying that Tom is going to probably say the same as, as the Irish distilleries because. Um, What's very interesting about the articles is just as much what's not written as what is. So, for example, the, the John's Lane article was written in 1923, or was published in November 1923. Um, now, why is it not published sooner than that? Because there's been a civil war going on. But there is no reference to that at all. There's no reference to the fact that Ireland is no longer part of uh, the United Kingdom, that it's its own separate country at this point uh so and, and actually if you contrast that with what the record is talking about as a journal it's completely different they are constantly very up to date about what's happening in ireland what's happening in in the politics of ireland the treatment of the distillers by you know the new free state the relationship uh, going on there the changes the you know introduction of uh you know trade barriers between Britain and Ireland or potential erection of, of trade barriers and plus a change. Uh, and the, there's so much there, which is it's left unsaid in, in the articles. And so you kind of get this impression of this huge industry in Ireland, which, you know, fundamentally, you know, things have changed since Barnard, but the fundamental structure of the Irish whiskey industry, you know, that they view as if you had it without that context, it would be sort of the same world, and yet it's completely different. Um, but the Irish yeah, distilleries... This edition mentions what they're doing about duty with the free state and what the yeah. situation is with, um, with with duty. But no, nothing else. You know. Yeah. It's, this is it's, how it affects tax. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. And, um, but the Irish distilleries are just absolutely huge. And, you know, I was in Dublin last month and I wanted to see where uh some of the distilleries you know what what's left of them basically and i took the liberty you, you whatsapp them to me and i took the liberty of doing a bit of then and now for you there yeah so that that has not changed very much i mean the plaque above the door has changed that's now the national college of art and design uh but that is pretty much the only thing that remains the same the stills are still there and actually the 
steam engine, which as far as I'm aware, isn't actually photographed in the book, unfortunately, but is mentioned. Uh, the steam engine is, is still in the building, uh, but that's all that remains. But, you know, that distillery, John's Lane, was producing a million proof gallons per annum, which for context is, I think, four times the amount that um, the largest malt whiskey distillery in Scotland was producing and only, a, I think, probably a third of what the grain distilleries were producing. Absolutely huge. And, mm -hmm. you know, as anyone who's been to Dublin knows, you know, right in the centre of the city and you go maybe 500 metres further down the road and then you get to Thomas Street. Thomas Street, they don't talk about the production capacities in this book, but in a separate article, they talk about it uh, in 1902 and, and Thomas Street was capable of producing 2 million uh, proof gallons uh, per annum. So, I mean, we're talking about distilleries on a completely different scale to what was in the Scotch whiskey industry. We're talking about distilleries that are slap bang in the center of the city uh, and huge, absolutely huge sites. I mean, the each of these were between, I think, six and 20 acre sites. I mean, that's the equivalent of at least, you know, um, Westminster Palace, for example, of each of those in the city centers with hundreds of people employed with, you know, like like um, you showed with the employees at John's Lane, you know, tons and tons of people. You went with Westminster Palace as your comparison for the size it's, of the Irish distilleries. It's <laughs> the only thing that I could find for six acre site. <laughs> it's the uh, one that's okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> So uh, it's uh, absolutely huge. I mean, for, for context, the Guinness uh, brewery, St. James's Brewery is 50 acres. So you're wow. talking, but that that really, when you're walking around that, it feels like, you know, its own town. And so you're, you're talking about sites which, you know, at their maximum were probably half the size of that. And there were several of them slap bang in the, in the center. Um, and they're amazing. And there's, there's a photo, which I, I don't think, I again, I just stumbled across again recently. I, and I'm not sure I mentioned it to you, but it's the photo of Coomba Distillery um and it's the mash ton and this is you know this is not one of the pot still distilleries this is actually just a malt distillery but i don't know where this is going to work but uh if you see that that's a man in one of the mash tons uh, they're just absolutely massive they're absolutely huge i'll tell you what would work better is if i prep the slide already there there we go <laughs> <laughs> if you told me what you were doing i could have just yeah, called that yeah, straight yeah. up <laughs> But yeah, uh, yes. I just, the scale is just phenomenal. And the engineering of that gearing and um, yeah, just, Beautiful. it must have been noisy and um, just amazing places to be in. I mean, difficult and dangerous places to work at times as well, I would think. But um, there's a change in tone in the book, isn't there, as well? We talk about the headwinds and I think, does the book end with Strathclyde Grain Distillery? Yeah, it does. And the Strathclyde, so that's published, I think, almost to the day, seven years later. Um, and it's a very different world that it finds itself in. So it's uh, 19, October 1929. It's published two weeks before the Wall Street crash. And the optimism of the early 1920s is well and truly dead. Um, and it talks about, basically says, uh, words to the effect of, it is absolutely amazing that someone has decided to build a new distillery. Uh, it's, it's completely remarkable, um, especially since so many of the old and well-established distilleries are now silent. Um, best of luck to them. Uh, so, you know, really you get the beginning of the twenties full of optimism, you know, full of feeling that after this, the first world war, after Spanish flu, after, you know, all of these disasters that, that things are gonna be, you know, turning turning better uh, and then you get to the end of the 1920s the realization that things are not turning better things are you know probably going to take a much more serious turn um and yeah really quite striking but at the same time what's also great about that article is that it gives you an insight into a brand new as modern as you can get distillery in the 1920s literally you know, built from scratch, everything in there, completely modern, completely new. 
and it's a very very detailed article with a lot of pictures i think I mean, off, off the top of my head it's like 15 different pictures of that so that's really kind of well cataloged of, you know what exactly a modern up-to-date distillery in the 20s look like right let's um let's bring tom in because i think he's got to shoot off at nine and we've already burned through three quarters of an hour pretty quickly so um let's bring tom in for a bit we can come back to some of your favorite um pictures again, again uh leon in a short while but good evening tom hi good evening good to be with you yeah thank you for coming along so you were one of the very first people to be um have the details of this secret product uh, project shared and, and to get yeah the of it. i uh yeah i mean leon sent me the um original sort of copy about seven or eight years ago so i've been it's been sitting in my laptop ever since and uh, I think like Leon, I didn't realize quite how significant this book was. I mean, it was, you know, it was only when you started delving into it, the, the nuggets of history. And it was, you know, a primary source of history. Um, it, you know, it wasn't just um, repeating what had already been done. It was a completely fresh source of uh, heritage history for the scotch whiskey industry at a really interesting time i i, I felt so so yeah it was it was great and then leon asked me to do the introduction and um he uh it went back and forth quite a few times but i think you know in the end we got you know a good intro to it and then i came up with the idea of um putting little sort of uh, a footnote at the end uh, which we compiled at the end of the book as to what happened to, you know, all the distilleries, you know, whatever happened to, um, you know, Glen, Glen Cool and Justin Hock on, on the South Esk, for example, you know, closed a year after the uh, book, uh, you know, after the that uh, magazine profile appeared. And the same with, you know, all those Campbelltown distilleries that, um, and as, as Leon was saying about, um, you know, the fact that the Irish uh, distillers didn't, you know, there wasn't mention of partition, there wasn't mention that it, the Republic was a separate country or anything like that. The same with Campbelltown, there wasn't really, you know, reading those profiles, any sense that the whole thing was about to almost implode completely, leaving, you know, just one distillery left uh, by the end of the 1920s. Mm. Yeah, amazing. I think you've done a super job, not only with the introduction, but the end notes are really, really helpful as well. And there's some great little nuggets in there. Was that the one that shut with the dispute with the local tennis club over water, um, the water supply? I thought that was a particularly good little nugget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of them got buried uh, under, you know, turned into garages, buried, un buried under housing. You know, I think it, it, it's a lottery where it, once your distillery closed, you know, whether you were, you know, uh, in the highlands, um, no one was going to build over you or you were in a town um, and you were going to get uh, redeveloped. Yeah, there's a little chart that just shows the uh, the split of where the distilleries are and whether or not they are still in production today. That's quite helpful. Um but tell me about a, a couple of the distilleries that, that, that struck you. Um, yeah. Well, about. I mean, exactly. Like like Leon was saying, I mean, Glenn Kinch's profile is fascinating. And, uh, you know, I like this little, um, I'll just read you a little bit. It said, the houses are surrounded by smiling gardens and embowered by, in trees, giving uh, the little village a singularly attractive appearance which is materially enhanced by the velvety green turf of a well-kept bowling green. The company's care for the welfare of the workmen extends to the revision of a dairy. Milk, uh, curiously enough, being a scarce commodity in the district. So, you know, you get a sense that they really care for the workers and also how um, picturesque Glen Kinchy was, which, of course, was one reason, well, that the only real reason that it was picked to be on the classic malt plinth and rosebank which should have been there you know wasn't um because when the suit from central office turned up at rosebank 
um, you know, the canal was stagnant and uh, probably a, is poking out of it. And you know, compared <laughs> to the velvety turf of the Glen Kinchy Bowling Green, you know, there wasn't any any competition. And uh, Rosebank closed uh, in 1993. And, and amazingly, you know, thank goodness it's being uh, resuscitated. And just a little story I was telling you about Arthur that I heard subsequently, this is from the 1950s, early 50s, um, that uh, the locals used to uh, swim in the canal when they were discharging hot water from the worm tubs. And it was a sort of heated, little bit of heated water for them to swim in. And I met this guy, uh, John Ferguson, who, who learned to swim there when he was about 12. And the lock keeper would close the gates um, and they, you know, the word got round that the water was coming out and in they jump. Um, you know, <laughs> kind of sweet, I thought. Yeah, really sweet, really sweet. Um, and you do get these changed worlds. Very much. It wasn't one you mentioned, but uh, when you described this kind of pastoral idyll, I mean, this just looks like a little country cottage, doesn't it? Yeah. This is Isla, uh but it's in Perth, isn't it, Isla? Uh, not in, not on Isla. And just, you know, what's that? A little greenhouse, is that off to the right there? On the right-hand side image, are they, gr are they growing some vegetables there, possibly? Yeah. Uh, Could and be. of course, yeah. yeah. And they're not expecting visitors. I mean, no. the, okay, the wine, some, they sent some hack from the wine spirit trade record, but mm. there's no visitor centres at this stage. No. That's the workers that's just to keep a nice place no i know i mean there was yeah there, there were a couple of others i was gonna just sort of mention uh sure. was um well one um that struck me was pulteney uh, mm -hmm. i don't know if you've got a picture of pulteney i can't remember uh, yeah yes I do. yeah well done um and well, four. Uh, so pulteney was um you know distilling uh in a dry town at the time and uh, in in the uh, in the book, it says, um, you know, it'd be interesting to have had Stevenson, as in Robert Louis Stevenson's impression, impressions of Wick under the dry regime. And doubtless he would have written a humorous, vivid and caustic description of the absurdity of the picture of a sturdy Highland fisherman quenching their thirst with soft drinks. And, <laughs> you know, and you've. You, you, behind the book, um, because I did read, you know, Leon um, shared with me some of the articles from the the magazine, and I was reading. And um, you know, I just I just like to read you this little piece here. Um, this is June nineteen twenty one, and um, this was the Wine and Spirit Trade Record, um, saying even it was obvious to all people of moderate, not to say conservative opinion that Sinn Féin, extreme socialism, Bolshevism and anarchy have succeeded in fixing their vicious tentacles into the vitals of poor old Britain, still tortured on the rack of restrictions and virtual prohibition after two and a half years of so-called peace. And, you know, it was a real battle. It was a real existential fight. Prohibition was raging in America. You know, that was that had come in, but it came you know, damn close to happening uh, here. Um, and Pulteney was, you know, uh, Wick was one of the towns that voted dry. And so you had this, in the records view, this absurdity of, you know, distilling whiskey in a town that you weren't allowed to drink anything more than soft drinks. Yeah, well, that's lovely. And you notice as well there, I, I had the, the fire engine as well, <laughs> yeah. um, which we mentioned electrification before. And of course, that's important because mm. the burning down of distilleries is mentioned on a number of occasions uh, yeah. throughout the book, as it is through history. I mean, there were a huge fire risk already with the mills, but also if you needed flame of any type um, to light. So electrification was a, was a great boon to them, I would think, for that reason also. Yeah. Um, mm. I prepped up McCallum. We were talking about McCallum the other day, Tom. Yeah. Yes. Um, and just thinking about scale as well and what the Stillman, uh, this McAllen, would think of the modern yeah. McAllen. Well, mean, abs yeah, absolutely. I mean, McAllen uh, back then, 
three stills and uh you know 36 today <laughs> and um, have you been to the new one yes i have i have and i did, uh, I did a little then and now for that one as well i mean what would yeah. they make of it and the, you know just a few guys wandering around operating all that they would be terrified at the very concept of it i know i know and one of the things that the i mean it's it's funny the 1920s they were still talking about bushels of malt and bushel is a very you know sort of medieval uh, measurement uh, uh, of its volume not not weight um but you can work out if you do the maths and and with bushels of malt and imperial gallons of uh, proof gallons so they're not you know pure alcohol they're about 50 percent alcohol but you could kind of work out that they were getting at macallan a yield of about i think it was 340 liters of pure alcohol per ton of grain and you know that would get you fired today as a distillery manager because 340 yeah so you know you 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 know you'd have to get you a minimum of 410 today now you know uh, less uh you know there would have been maybe less chemicals used less yield maybe there was more flavor in that barley some heritage variety they were using who knows maybe it was a better whiskey who knows yeah there's going to be a few different takes on that and i've already part of the fascinating thing about this book is um and watching people react to it at whiskey fringe was especially with the exhibitors you know you've yeah. got the the, the 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 new school guys like the thompson brothers up at dornock and some others who are building a, a small distillery based on heritage barley and low yeah. volume or low yield i should say and they were looking for things about yeast yeah, other big distillers were interested in it for very, very different reasons. I think there'll be a lot of people projecting their view of what they want out of modern whiskey, desperately yeah. trying to prove their point from information in the book. Sure. Well, I mean, and there's, you know, pride in some of these distilleries. You know, we get our, our, our malts, we get our barley from the local farms. They come or we get it only from Forfarshire barley or whatever. And others are proudly proclaiming they get it from Australia or they get it from Denmark. You know, they're, they're uh, um, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the examples where I think we have to take some of the answers with a pinch of salt. Mm. Um, I think Dr. Nick is maybe going to talk about that a little bit. They, they can't all have been using the Scottish barley all the time, but... Um, but that's one of the fascinating elements you've got to interpret. I'm aware that's nine o'clock. You've got something delicious in the oven you need to get to. I have. I'll just, well, can I just leave with one one uh, point here? And this Please. is... Stay as long as you like, as long as you can. Well, I'll just tell you about... Um, this is from Lefroig, and I, I, I know we, we, we didn't have time to get a, a picture of Lefroig, but... Uh, I'll just read you this little passage from the book, and it says, The dreaded gorges, uh, gadgers or excisemen, encouraged by the authorities, redoubled their efforts to suppress smuggling about this period, and the ownership of a wee small still gradually became a dangerous and unprofitable hobby. A vivid idea of the popular attitude towards the revenue officials during this time of repression is obtained from the story of the visitor to Isla, who asked a villager how many gorges were there in the neighbourhood. The Highlander lit his pipe reflectively and replied, oh, Hey, we had one here last week, but we drooned it. <laughs> and, you know, it's, there, there's so much humour in the tales of the gorgeous i mean the word smuggling comes up 76 times in all these profiles uh -huh. and yet and yet as leon was saying to me you know in the magazine at the time you know they were casting a you know outrageous uh you know criminal activity of, of, of illicit stills and yet there was this romanticized uh re reflection that shared with alfred barnard about the you know the, the the smuggling the heroic um highlander the the noble savage uh with his still 
You know. There's a real, well, the, the expression I've used, the modern expression is cognitive dissonance, isn't it, that they yeah. have for revering the days of smuggling and also celebrating the capture of, of the people who are avoiding paying tax. In, but the source of it must come that they hate how much tax is on whiskey, yeah. as people do now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, the tales of smuggling and how that contrasted to their, you know, their actual take on illicit distillation in, in the present day, in the 1920s. Um, it, you know, it, it reminded me of visiting um, uh, Niagara Falls, where there's a museum to all the daredevils who've gone over the falls in uh, barrels and in, in drums and uh, what have you, and celebrating that. At the same time, there are signs all around the, the falls saying, you know, don't you dare try and go down, we, you know, you'll be shot on sight if you try and do it, you know, so it's it's the same kind of um, idea somehow. That's a lovely analogy. I really, really like that. Yeah. Um, well, bon appetit. Enjoy your dinner. I will. But anyway, good to join you both. And I'm, I'm really glad that, that the book's doing well, as it deserves to. It's been a labour of love. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much, Tom. Thanks again for a great introduction, all your work on the book. Uh, so, where have we got to? Nice to see Dr. Nix uh, checking up on what we're saying. It's um, <laughs> it when we get the historians in, we're going to get some adults talking about this because we're very much, well, I speak for myself and Dave, we're very much enthusiastic amateurs. And so we're really looking forward to getting that historical framework and context and rigor. And uh, along with Dr. Nick, we'll have uh, Professor Neil McKenzie. Um, so where have we got to? Should we just wrap up with a few other, just for the fun of it, just things we loved about the book or you loved about the book? Um, uh, Glenn Oogie, you know, again, we, 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 we last looked at Strathclyde. There we go. There seem to be animals at, at so many of these distilleries, and they are actively working. There are stables and, and cows and, <laughs> and all sorts. Glenugi is um, great because it's one of the few where you actually get a glimpse into uh, who the writer or, or writers even uh, may have been. I mean, everything was published anonymously. We don't know um, who wrote it. We don't know even if it was just one writer. Um, it looks like, I mean, if I was to put a bet on it, I'd say probably one writer did the lion's share of it and maybe some of the articles at the end might have been written by someone else actually um there's a couple of uh, things later on where they talk about their correspondence and so on uh but the glen Uge one's quite entertaining because he spends as much time talking about uh how good his lunch was and uh how how wonderful it was to wash it all down with 1895 glen Uge single malt uh and then go and play a few rounds on the links uh, which is quite quite a nice insight into you know the the people behind this and actually you know for some of these I mean the, the way he talks about this in particular um, the tour of the distillery and talking about the distillery is is uh, really sandwiched between his breakfast and his dinner uh, which is yeah. a great insight. That voice is very different, um, and it almost to me my interpretation of it was. The editor of the magazine said, I'll yeah. take this one, I'll do this one. It's like <laughs> David Charlie Smith bags did that one and hopped on a train and they even stand around and watch some locals for a while and um, just yeah. uh, <laughs> having fun. It seemed quite modern, that one. It quite chimed with the, the, the modern uh, drinks, uh, drinks writer. Um, <laughs> incidentally, one friend of the show seem to think they might have a way of working out who the writers were and is doing some research but he refuses to commit and, yeah refuses to commit because he said i might make an ass of myself so but fingers crossed we've got <laughs> someone onto it as talking of detective work uh some of the people are really interesting Who's this guy? The brewer standing by at Fetiken. Standing by to do what? To catch the killer? Yeah. It's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great photo, that one. I mean, it really feels like something out of a film war. Um, 
you know, detective thing is absolutely great. And what a wonderful mustache he has. Uh, the guy at Ardbeg, I think, also has a great mustache as well. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's some quite mysterious ones. There's another one which is a personal favourite at Glenmorangie, which is the team uh, and their dog, uh, which is a uh, as as far as I've been able to find the only dog in the book. But there may be others as well. No cats, as far as I can see. Um, but yeah, really. On the left, I'd never know. I didn't know. Oh no, he's standing behind. The, sorry, he's standing behind a malt shovel. I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, he's standing behind a malt shovel. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, the and, uh, yeah, and the twenty-seven men of ten. What's that right at the front? A still, tiny still. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but that's, I've never that's not dawned on me until now. Yeah, no, yeah. A great little still in a worm tub. Yeah, There's, I mean. Uh, and that's that's the nice thing, you know. The the more you get into it, the more you discover these sort of little, you know, tidbits and and things and the images that because there's so much in there that it, you know certain things hit you, and then you take yeah. another closer look and it's like, oh wait a second, what what about that? Um, the hat, I was, I was... that image, the hat. But I... <laughs> um... So there's quite, you can see the managers, there's a hierarchy to the hat, or the owners, I should say, maybe. Uh, yeah. They've got their kind of trilby style, then they've got the Peaky Blinders style. And then one guy, I ain't wearing no hat, um, <laughs> or I forgot my hat. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hats. There's some great hats, and the, some jaunty styles to wear in them as well. Uh, yeah, again, just one image. And sometimes, very much. And other times, you know, there's something quite modern about this guy. Um, and that's actually a really striking photograph, I thought. Um, yeah. Who's that guy? Remarkable it's, work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's recent enough, you know, we could potentially work out who some of these people are. Um, and you went to a great deal of effort in to do an index of people as well, which I think um, will turn up some great nuggets because people are mentioned a lot and people's careers are traced. They talk about who's the chap who comes down from Kay, um, Craig Ellicky to Hazelburn and they mm. talk about people who were respected as a brewer here going across to there. Of course, it's a trade journal, so they're, they're talking about respected people within the industry. And I think we're going to maybe track down a few grandfathers or great grandfathers of people yeah well i mean you know the james ed business was founded by someone wanting to revive their great great grandfather's company so there's always been that sort of family history aspect to it i mean in some ways james ed is the strangest episode of who do you think you are that's ever been made um <laughs> and then you know when i was showing this to um anna winchester and you know talking about the hazelburn article and he mentioned that uh, Peter Innes in there is uh, the grandfather of Alan Wolfenstone. Um, and, I, you know, a few a couple of months after I got my hands on, you know, the wonderful book that uh, he and Ruth Heard did uh, on uh, Takatsuru's notebook. Um, and so seeing seeing those links within the industry and, and how in many of these distilleries, you know, people have worked in distilleries for a long time. So, and they may well not be the first generation of their families to do that. I thought it was very important that, um, you know, to be able to to bring that kind of family history aspect in there as well. And actually, since you mentioned the Glen, Glen Moore picture, um, Jason Whiskey Rover, who's been doing the Glen Moore project, uh, he wrote a very interesting kind of deep dive on the Glen Moore uh, distillery article from the book and actually was having a stab at potentially identifying the people in the picture and, and that would be you know if people can can do that then that would be absolutely wonderful that'd be very good fun mm -hmm. yeah um and it's been again great to see people's reactions um and in many different ways people who have a huge overview of the industry from a career working in it or people who have this very narrow, and I don't mean that as a criticism. I mean that, you know, they love a certain distillery and have read huge amounts, anything they could about that individual distillery. 
to the point that they may even be the world expert on that individual distillery, such as Jason, because no one else had wanted to. And has done this amazing piece of work, the Glenugi, guy on Glenugi, there's a Rosebank mm -hmm. guy, Marcel Van Kiel's at Lefroy. And there, we know, frantically unwrapping this book and um, and turning to the page um, that uh, their distillery is on and seeing what it has added to their knowledge. And that's been so, so great to see. And actually, it's worth saying, you and I have spoken for a long time of how do we unleash this tome onto the world? Um, and we very much wanted to keep the general knowledge of it and the existence of it a secret as long as possible. And we wanted everyone to receive the book at the same time. We wanted no spoilers. We yeah. wanted the community to have that same amazing feeling of discovery, which is like, oh, how can this exist? <laughs> this is so great that this exists. And I think I was delighted with how we worked on that and how we got that to happen uh, because the excitement's been just superb. You know, I'm just randomly going to put up Stronachy Distillery. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at it. What a beautiful distillery. Stro I mean, Stronachy might be the weirdest one in the whole thing, actually, because I think they... You know, in the in the two or three pages on on that distillery, you have um, they did the they malted the barley at the train station, then they had a narrow gauge railway which took it half the way to the distillery, uh, then they stuck it on a truck to bring it to the distillery, and the location of the distillery was chosen because I think it was near the owner's country estate, and mm -hmm. and it was incredibly remote. It closed a couple of uh, years yeah. after. After yeah, his profile, I had to close. It sounded pretty inefficient to me. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it was it was effectively, by the sounds of it, it was the owner's sort of vanity project. I mean, what a wonderful vanity project to have. <laughs> yeah, there might be a few of those built at the moment, um, <laughs> but I hope we survive. I said it's different times, and look, we're probably worrying. Quarter past nine. I mean, it's going to be a wellspring of information. And we're only just starting to get the feedback from everybody and do our own research and look at it. But I mean, you, you started to put some great stuff together um, in terms of uh, output of distilleries, estimated annual output based on the information that they do put in the book there. And so these are the small distilleries up to half a million litres of alcohol estimated per year. Um, the green are still active today. The red have closed. So that's it. Okay. The very smallest ones down at the end there that I mentioned, they, they closed. But otherwise, it's a fairly even um, spread. There's no particular pattern there. But then once you look at the larger distilleries, something a bit more happening there, isn't there? Yeah. Actually, some of the larger ones mentioned have shut. Which I suppose should be a huge surprise, but um, but was interesting nonetheless. And we just use all this data now. Okay, again, the accuracy of it could be questioned, sure. Um, and it's incomplete. They don't mention the um, output or and the input actually of, of the bushels of barley for all distilleries. But we can put it into graphs and play around with it, can't we? We can have a bit of fun. Weekly output relative to efficiency. Do you want to explain that one, Leon? Yeah, I mean, like you were saying, I mean, with, with something like this, um, yes, you can question the uh, accuracy of some of the figures <laughs> that were given. I mean, the <laughs> big outlier there is Brookladdy, which apparently was, you know, the most efficient distillery by country mile. Uh, and a level of efficiency that no other distillery could have ever come close to, um, which is quite interesting considering I think they talk quite a lot about the use of horses at Brookladdy at the time. Um, so you sort of wonder whether there was maybe a typo with uh, a couple of the numbers, but actually most of them are, are pretty pretty bang on the money. And, and you know, what's, what's quite interesting to see here is, I mean, when you look at the efficiency, how many proof guns they were getting out of the bushels, you know, there you can see there isn't really any correlation between the distilleries 
that were producing lots of whiskey and and the distilleries that were producing much less i mean the some of the campbelltown ones for example are much more efficient than you know mortlach Dalyun and, and I think Glen Livet is the least efficient distillery of the lot, um, which yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure has changed. Um, so it, it's it's more about being able to pull out a sort of general picture and, and see what's there. But it, for me, it was quite striking that the big distilleries, you know, the ones that were producing a lot a hundred years ago, are broadly um, broadly the big. The, well, not the big, but certainly the ones that are around today. And what was also interesting is how some of the Isla distilleries are well, some of the biggest producers of malt whiskey, um, which certainly isn't the case now. Um, so, although yeah, there's you look at the, the regional output, I mean, Grady's not a region, but um, of the distilleries mentioned in the book where capacity is mentioned. So this is a pretty partial graph, but still, Ireland and grain, boof. Yeah. <laughs> big, big amounts of liquid. And of course, um, uh, the age of the single malt is uh, going to take a little bit of a back seat for a while um, um, uh, after this period. Um, so I think we've probably left a little bit in the chamber for our future discussions i mean we've covered maybe what's that 20 or so photographs 25 photographs of the 650 or so in this book um is there anything else you wanted to say leon or, or do you think you've fairly covered that well i mean the, the other thing i wanted to say actually is um i for me one of the most enjoyable parts of the whole book was tom's end notes actually the the paragraphs on each of the distilleries um because it's i mean it's a great idea of his and it's a very a it's a very 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 satisfying way of ending the book you know the natural question when you reach all of these is what happened next um for some of the names we know what happened next for others you know like you mentioned that sort of went down in a blaze of glory in a fight with a local tennis club or you know other such other such things uh, the, the story is a bit more muddy and, and there's stuff in there which is, you know, I certainly have never seen before, um, which I'm not sure are, are that well known. And, and I think it's a really wonderful resource. I think Thompson did a really superb job on that. So um, the articles are, you know, fascinating and, and there's so much information there that, you know, even you know, you or I, I don't think has, has come close to processing just there's, there's so, so much. Um, but I, I also think some of the other things that come along with it, uh, such as Tom's introduction, the uh, end notes and, and other things, just take it up to another level. And, and, you know, there's really a lot of interesting stuff out there for, for people who are interested. So, yeah, yeah it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while, I think, um, for a lot of people to come to terms with all this new information and we hope that the next week or so on the Clement Crane will be a kind of good start to that. I, I'm certainly valuing the input of the whiskey community so far and people just noticing little things that I had not noticed at all. Um, but um, congratulations again. I have congratulated you many, many times before, but um, uh, Congratulations again. Thank you so much for a huge, huge contribution to the whiskey community. Um, I will uh, say goodbye now, I think, Leon. Thank you again. And um, yeah, I hope you'll be able to tune in. I think you're on holiday next week, aren't you? But maybe you could tune in from the Black Forest or wherever you are. Absolutely. From deepest, darkest Germany. Yeah, I will uh, be tuning in. I'll be the first one there and I, I can't wait to see what uh, Nick and Niall and uh, Alan and, and Robert and, and the other guests that you've got uh, coming on have to say. It will be a real pleasure to hear what, what experts with a lot of knowledge uh, are able to dig out of this. And I will be glued to my screen when they're live. So yeah, can't wait. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, cheers, Ian. So um, thank you very much for watching. It's great to be back. Uh, we have quite a number of things planned for Liquid Antiquarian. It's been a big break as the day job 
uh, came back at Dave and I pretty hard and traveling started again. And so we did have a big hiatus, but don't worry, we have been beaming away in the background. We've got lots of things um, that uh, we want to talk about. So uh, please do follow us, do all the things that people do on social media. Apparently it's really helpful. Um, and we're going to have lots of really cool stuff for you this autumn. You know, cool in our world anyway, not cool compared to what normal people think. But anyway, thanks very much. Really good to be back. Bye.